Our speaker today is an expert on the area of prayer. Uh, there are a number of fantastic prayer movements going on around the world. And uh, our speaker today set up one of those movements, 24-7 Prayer. 24-7, uh, we have a 24-7 Prayer Room, which is across the car park you may have seen on your way in. And that is such a great space. If you've not tried going into the Prayer Room, you can book an hour. We have a regular prayer slot that, that I go into um, with my team, and we spend a, an hour praying. And you know what is the most refreshing time. You never want it to end. And, uh, and so Pete Gregg is our speaker today. He's set up these prayer rooms all over the place. He started this movement. He's written a couple of books. Uh, Red Moon Rising, if you haven't read this, is a fantastic account of how 24-7 started and uh, this movement of prayer around the world. And uh, this one, God on Mute, which is, um, is one of the most profound books I think I've read, which is if you've ever asked the question, you know, why does it seem sometimes that when I pray, God seems to be on mute? Why does it seem like he, he can't hear my prayers or he doesn't seem to be answering them? This is a fantastic book that explores some of those things, but it's also incredibly encouraging about prayer, incredibly down to earth, and I thoroughly recommend this book. So I'd encourage you to get that. But we don't need to read the book right now because we have him here in person. So please would you welcome Pete Gregg as he comes to speak today. We're in London, in Europe, where the church is meant to be in decline, and instead God has birthed something here that has gone to 27 million people around the world, and we see the church growing, and we see the gospel working, and we're seeing marriages restored, and lives put back together again, and we know Jesus, and it's never hopeless, is it, when you have Jesus, amen? Amen. So let's, uh, let's turn to the scriptures. We're going to look at Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. And after three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark. Don't go near it. And Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among us. Uh, we've got thousands of leaders from more than 80 nations coming together, representing most Christian denominations, united in the gospel as our guests here in London at the Royal Albert Hall and at the Hammersmith Apollo. And we're coming together to build friendships and to seek God at a time of great significance. And we are seeking to be equipped to make a difference for Jesus together. Tomorrow God will do amazing things amongst us. But today, he says, we must consecrate ourselves. We must set our hearts apart. We must purify ourselves and get ready for what he is going to do. The word there for consecrate is kadash. It means hallow yourself. It's the same as when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And Joshua says to the people, you must do this for yourselves. You must set yourselves apart. This isn't just going to be done for you. It's not, not enough just to be part of the crowd, going along with everyone tomorrow. You must very intentionally set yourself apart for God. Get yourself ready. And so we're, we're going to do that tonight together. If you're a regular at HTB, and you're coming to the conference tomorrow, this is our moment to, to prepare ourselves. If you're a visitor from overseas, maybe you've been traveling, uh, may, maybe you've left loved ones behind, and there's been lots of activity, this is our time just to pause, 
and prepare ourselves. Maybe if you're part of HTB and you're not coming to the conference, well, you can still come if you want to tomorrow. The day pass is available. But, of course, God's blessing isn't just through conferences. There are many amazing things he wants to do in each of our lives. Let's prepare our hearts. It's very intentional. I'm at that stage in life, I've got two teenage sons, and I seem to spend uh, most of my time driving them around, driving them places. Does anyone here have the same cross to bear? Amen. And um, the other day, I'd, uh, I'd gone to collect my two sons from a friend's house. It was quite late, and um, it was a cold winter's night. I had my slippers on, and... Um, I couldn't be bothered to change them. And so I, I just went and I drove around to this friend's house in my slippers, thinking nothing of it. But as I went in, one of my sons took one look at the slippers and he said, oh, Dad, that's so embarrassing. You're wearing your slippers. And the other son said, that is way cool. <laughs> he said, I can't wait to be old enough to just let myself go like that. <laughs> God says to us, get your shoes on, get ready, we're getting moving, we're, we're about to move. The historical context, of course, of the people of Israel was that they had been preparing for this moment for 40 years, uh, they'd been wandering in the wilderness since they had been liberated from Egypt. They'd crossed the Red Sea miraculously, and now they're going to have to cross the Jordan River. Uh, and they've been anticipating and praying for and imagining this moment for a generation. In fact, it's more than 40 years. It's 500 years almost, because even through the years in captivity, they've been waiting. And they're about to enter Canaan. It's just the crossing of a river, but it's the change of everything, the change of landscape, the change of leadership, the change of economy, the change of the way that God speaks to them. You, you know, in different seasons of your life, God speaks to you in different ways. Sometimes we think God's gone silent, but it's just that he's speaking to you differently to the way you got used to hearing him. The people of Israel have been following a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. It's been very easy. And now they're about to enter the promised land. It's going to change. Their economy is going to change. They've been provided miraculously with manna from heaven, and now they're going to have to learn to farm the land. God's strategies change at different times in our lives. Everything's about to change, and they are excited, but they are also, I expect, terrified. There is anticipation, but there is also trepidation. There is great faith, but there is also great fear. This unfortunately named place, Shittim, uh, literally means... <laughs> Let's just pray for the translators, shall we? <laughs> literally means the acacias. You could name your house uh, after... And, if the Lord speaks powerfully through this sermon tonight, you name a child. And um, the Acacias. So they're camped out somewhere about six miles from the River Jordan, and it's a really nice place. There's the Acacias, and they must have thought, do we really want to cross that swollen river? We know God did it in the past uh, for our forefathers, but will he do it for us? Will we get across this river? Will it happen again? And then they know there's going to be battles against fortified cities, new challenges ahead. And so they've got all these different emotions going on, and they're counting the cost. You know, sometimes it's possible to get comfortable wandering around in the wilderness. Sometimes it's possible to get comfortable in compromise. Sometimes it's possible to get secure in our insecurities. So used to uh, areas of sin and brokenness that if we're really honest, we almost don't want to change. 
But God loves us too much to leave us where we are. And he calls us to step out, to cross the Jordan and take hold of the promise for which he called us. No matter how long you've been a Christian, maybe you're not even a Christian here today, there is always more in God for you. He has a promise for your life. He has a purpose for your life, and you have not yet fully stepped into it. No matter what you've seen, no matter what encouragements you've had, there is always more in God. If you're not yet a Christian, and you're just here because you sort of maybe vaguely believe in God, and you're asking a few questions... It's do the Alpha course that's about to start. No one's going to like force anything on you, but you can talk. And as you talk, you'll find that it's interesting and fascinating because there's always more in God. And actually, sometimes you'll hear stories of how God is changing people's lives, and it, it will be compelling because there's nothing more exciting than a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're just a new Christian. And, and, and you've given your life to Christ. You're beginning to follow him. You're beginning to learn to hear his voice in the scriptures and through the whispers of his Holy Spirit. You're, you're learning in discipleship. And you can continue on this pathway for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And there will still be more in Christ to discover. Maybe you're a leader here and you, you've studied theology and you teach other people, but you know in your heart of hearts, you don't know it all yet. And it may even be that God is changing your mind about some things and expanding your heart or softening your heart again. There's new revelation coming. There's new experiences, new challenges, new ways in which he is seeking to use you because there's always more in Christ. Or maybe you're coming towards the end of your life. Even in that last moment, there is always more in Christ because death doesn't get the last word. And so the people of Israel are there, camped out, comfortable at one level with their wilderness existence, but God is calling them on, calling them to more. As I was praying about the message this evening, a friend of mine who knows nothing about what I am preaching on now, he texted me, he said, I, I, I sense God's given me a prophetic word for someone here. And he, he, he said, um, I sense that, that, that there's someone um, who the Lord is saying to you, it's time to take hold of his promise for your life. It's time to actually lay hold of a promise that he has spoken over you and that you have been looking around and comparing yourself with others. And you've been looking in and getting insecure and he said it's time to look up and look to God because it's not about your giftedness, it is about his kindness and his grace. It's not about your ability, it is about your availability. And the Lord's saying it's time to step forward, to cross the Jordan, to lay hold of the promise he has got over your life. Don't just camp out in the wilderness paralyzed by fear. So how do we consecrate ourselves? How do we do this Kadash hallowing of ourselves thing? Well, clearly, partly, it's about repentance. If there's rubbish in our lives, sin, things coming between us and God, we've got to get rid of it. You, you know, neither God nor Satan care that much about you sinning. It's all about your relationship with God. And sin is the thing that blocks your relationship with God. That's why it matters to them, but that's not the end game. If... Um, feeding hamburgers to elephants could somehow block your relationship with God, you would at times be overwhelmed with an almost irresistible desire to go to McDonald's on your way to London Zoo. 
It's not about the sin, it is about relationship. And so consecration is about getting rid of the junk that's getting in the way of our relationship with God. We're not just consecrated from sin, we're consecrated for relationship with God, set apart for Him. A few years ago, my wife Sammy and I, we, 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 as the Americans say, we flipped a house. We, we borrowed some money because we, we found this house that was in the most terrible state. And so we just saw potential all over it. This house um, was, was um, very run down. No one had done anything to the garden in a long time. It was painted dark purple inside. Forgive me if your house is painted dark purple. <laughs> but it, it, it's not a way of drawing light and space into a room. And the people living there were heavy smokers, and the ceilings were stained with cigarette smoke, and one of the ceilings was actually falling down. And Sammy and I took one look at this house, and because it was so run down, we thought, potential. And we borrowed some money, we did it up. The first day, going into this enormous project, we knew it would be stupid to just start putting down new floors and decorating. The first thing we did was we ordered a skip, and we went in and we started taking out all the rubbish and cleaning the place. And then once we'd done that, we started to put the pretty stuff in. And it's like that with God. First of all, we, we clear out rubbish. We, we clean ourselves up in his power. And then he brings beauty in. The, the scriptures say that if we confess our sins, if we admit them, he is faithful and just, and he'll forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And all we have to do is admit it. You cannot be too sinful for God, only too proud to admit it. And in my experience, after how many years in Christian leadership, I still very regularly have to come back to God and say, I'm sorry. I've sinned. I've sinned in something I've thought. Or I've sinned in something I've said or an attitude. And he is faithful and just and forgives me and cleanses me. You cannot be too sinful, only too proud. And so that's part of consecration. It may be as we prepare ourselves tonight for the amazing things God's going to do tomorrow that there are things that we need to repent of get right. It's a little bit like each one of us has gone to the doctor and we've received a diagnosis that is terminal. The scriptures say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin are death. We, we've got a terminal diagnosis, maybe a vital organ is failing. And so the search goes out to find someone who can donate an organ. And they're not finding anyone, and our days are getting shorter. And then the gospel says that God himself so loved us, he came forward, and he gave us the vital organ, and in the process, he died on the operating table. And so we say to the surgeon, get this dying organ out of me and put that living organ in me. And then for every day of the rest of our lives, we wake up in the morning and we say, I am alive because he died. I will live for him because he gave everything for me. We live our lives overflowing with gratitude and thanksgiving to God who so loved us that he gave everything for us. That's the gospel message. Love gives. When I asked Sammy out for the first time, I, I gave her two presents. No one had said to me, you must give her two presents. It wasn't a technique. Maybe it was a little bit of a technique. <laughs> I, I, just love gives. I, I bought her a very nice pair of earrings that I had bought from the Argos catalog. <laughs> and I also gave her a book on football, which um, subsequent years have proven was a really bad present. But, um, and then when we got 
married, we made these vows, as many of you have, and, 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 and someone said to me, do you give her everything you've got, and your body, and in sickness, and in health, and your car, and your record collection, and I said, I do. And if you were an alien from outer space, you might think that is the saddest moment of his life. He's just had to give up everything to this woman. But it's actually the happiest day of my life. Because love gives. And when we brought our first baby home, I started having to spend money on him. A lot. And it hasn't stopped. And I'm not planning to invoice him. You know, love gives. God so loved the world that he gave everything, gave his own son, that who ever believes in him should not die but have everlasting life. And so we respond to his sacrifice with the sacrifice of our sin. We consecrate ourselves. Consecration isn't about condemnation. It is an invitation to relationship, to greater freedom. I have a friend when she took her motorbike test she was very nervous and um, the guy taking the test noticed this and he said "Um, I'm not here to fail you I'm here because I want to pass you if I possibly can that is the heart of God towards us we're not trying to tick off some moral checklist in order again to bless us he wants to bless us And then, you know, I said I'm always having to confess stuff and repent for stuff. And I get really annoyed, not by big things, but by really little things. Like, I get really annoyed by people who put photographs of food on Facebook. Does anyone else? Yeah. Don't do that. And and I get really annoyed by people who drive really slowly in front of me and who drive really fast behind me. And another thing that really annoys me as a church leader is when the lyrics on the screen during worship are lagging behind the singers. Anyone else get annoyed by that? Oh my goodness, it's like revival out there. And and I kind of sit there thinking, how difficult can it be to press that button, you know? There's hundreds of us here worshiping the Lord, and the guy on the video desk is clearly playing Angry Birds, you know? I I get so angry about it. And I'm pretending to worship. I'm there, oh, yeah, and inside I'm like, ah! The other day I had a breakthrough. I I had a complete breakthrough. I, 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 I found I was overwhelmed by grace towards the person who was doing the lyrics even though they were lagging behind, and occasionally, on one occasion, it was actually the wrong song entirely. (laughs) And if someone next to me had complained and told me that it was outrageous, I'd have told them to shut up and that it didn't matter. And the key to me having that breakthrough was that it was my teenage son's first day on the screens, and I knew how hard he was trying and I knew he'd got up early and had a high-protein breakfast just to be ready for the task. (laughs) See, the Father's heart is that you would succeed. It is a heart of grace towards you. And when he says, consecrate yourself, it's not because he wants to somehow tell you off, but he's inviting you into relationship. Consecration is not condemnation. It is a celebration of grace. It is an invitation to deeper relationship. And so we seek his presence. Again and again, the people of Israel are told to follow the Ark of the Covenant, the representation of God's presence amongst them. Sixteen times in these two chapters, it mentions the Ark of the Covenant. At a time of transition, 
the most important thing you can do is prioritize the presence of God. If you're in a time of change, can I urge you to prioritize prayer and worship, to attend diligently to the whisper of the Holy Spirit, to listen carefully in your busyness to the still small voice of God. That's how we'll keep in step with the Spirit. You know, the foundation of everything we do at HTB is prayer and worship. Everything else flows from that place of God's presence and our grateful response to His love. Alpha, it's just kind of a symptom of prayer and worship that we're so amazed by God that we want others to know. Caring for ex-offenders, social transformation, it's because Jesus is the hope and we know him. Prayer and worship is right at the heart. And um, I just saw this so beautifully illustrated. Just, I think it was three weeks ago, I was in Cambodia. And I just want to finish with this story, and we're going to pray for one or two people. I met this amazing woman in a village on the border between Cambodia and Thailand. This is Jean Sawong. She is a farmer. And uh, she married a man uh, called Sambo, and he was a Khmer Rouge fighter fighting for Pol Pot. And so when he was a teenager, at an age where most of our teenagers wouldn't be allowed to drive a car or buy alcohol, he was torturing and killing people. And when eventually he left the Khmer Rouge, he was so plagued by shame and guilt and the memories of what he had done that he turned to alcohol. And she found herself married to a drunk. And when he was drunk, he would beat her violently. And then she connected with some Christians. And he heard about this and he forbade her from becoming a Christian. And she assured him she wouldn't become a Christian. She just was going to this little church because they gave her food. But actually, she did become a Christian. And she didn't dare to tell her husband, but she did dare to begin to pray for him. Do you know there are times when you can't do anything? but you can pray. There are times where nothing really matters but your prayers for a person or a situation because in prayer, we give a landing pad to the will of God into any situation on earth using our free wills. And so she began to pray for Sambo and then things got worse. Have you ever noticed when you pray, sometimes things get worse, not better? (laughs) Don't give up. So she prayed for him, and he fell fell into an alcohol-induced coma. And in the coma, someone appeared to him and said that he should follow the man Jesus. So he woke up from the coma and gave his life to Jesus Christ and immediately came off alcohol. He said to me, "I, I feel sick even thinking about alcohol. I've never touched another drop. And he stopped beating his wife, and their marriage was restored. And they began to share about Jesus with people around the village, but no one was interested in the testimony of an ex-terrorist, drunk, wife-beater. But he began to get discipleship from these Christians. For two years, they taught him the Bible. They taught him the way God loves him and forgives him. And they also taught him farming, frog farming, to be precise, because there's a need for frog farmers in that part of the world. There might be a need for frog farmers in your part of the world, too. It's a delicacy. And so after two years, he launched a frog farming business just three months ago from now. And it has been so successful that in its first two months, he's raised enough money to buy a tractor. Let's see the next slide. You'll see Sambo here. Can you see the red wheel of the tractor in the background? You have no idea how proud he is of that tractor. It's parked in his kitchen. (laughs) The gospel looks a lot like a red tractor parked in a kitchen right now. 
And then he has drawn 23 other families in with him on this farming business out of a village of 230 families. And in two months, he has led all 23 of those families to Jesus Christ. So that is 10% of his village in the last two months have come to Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? But it doesn't, it doesn't stop there because, you see, whilst, whilst he was drunk and beating his wife, their three sons had been trafficked to Thailand and had been working in slavery for six years working 21 hours a day on a building site. One of them's disappeared, and we think he's probably died. The other two eventually escaped. But they returned to their village with heavy hearts because although they were now free from slavery, they knew they were going back to a situation with a drunk dad who might by now even have killed their mum and no economic hope whatsoever. And instead, they got home and discovered that their mother and father are restored, followers of Jesus, that their dad is no longer a drunk, that in fact he is the pastor of 10% of the village. And let's see the next photograph. This is their son Chan holding a tiny little frog. And when I said to him, what's your dream for the future? His eyes lit up and he is going to be the greatest frog farmer that part of Cambodia has ever seen. That's the gospel. That's the good news. We seek God in prayer, and miracles happen. Lives are changed. Salvation breaks out. Transformation comes to families and to communities. But the heart and soul of it all, of these amazing things, is the consecration towards God. And so I wonder what that looks like for you this evening. To consecrate your heart to God. Maybe it's this challenge around change. Prioritizing God's presence. You've become a little comfortable in this in-between place. Or maybe it's the challenge simply of repentance. There's some rubbish you need to get out of your life. Or maybe it's around expectancy. Daring to believe that amazing things are about to come. But let's just take a moment now, each one of us, to talk to God, to consecrate our hearts. Whatever that looks like for you.